Good morning, good evening, and good afternoon, and welcome to this latest episode of the South Asia Chat series, a podcast series hosted by the Institute of South Asian Studies in the National University of Singapore. I am Amitendu Palit, Senior Research Fellow and Research Lead for the Trade and Economics Program at the ISAS in the NUS. And I'm delighted to uh, share that I have with me here today in this podcast, a very uh, distinguished guest, Mr. Stephen Olson. Mr. Stephen Olson is Senior Adjunct Fellow at the Pacific Forum and Visiting Lecturer and Non-Resident Fellow at the Yaita Institute of International Trade and Finance. And aside of all this, uh, Stephen Olson, and as he's popularly known as Steve to almost everybody who knows him, is a veteran expert on trade policy issues, has been uh, very closely connected with the trade negotiation exercise in the United States and has been following trade in Asia and the rest of the world very closely for a number of years. Steve, a very, very warm welcome to this podcast. Well, thanks, Amitendo, uh, very much. Thank you for your kind invitation. It's a pleasure to be here, um, and it was a pleasure to see you recently in Tokyo. Thank you so much. So, Steve, uh, today, actually, this particular series that we have with us, and given that we have uh, the privilege of hosting you, uh, we wanted to reflect on uh, the general scenario of world trade, not in terms of specifically what we are expecting to happen in the world trade landscape going ahead in terms of numbers specifically, but in terms of what might be the sort of catalytic developments that might impact the prospects of world trade. So let me start uh, on that, Steve, with uh, referring to, uh, you know, this this uh, mega event that is uh, the symbolic event of world trade and whatever is happening or not happening around it, the ministerial conference number 13 or the MC 13, mm -hmm. uh, which concluded uh, in Geneva at the end of last month. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, the MC 13, of course, uh, there was a certain degree of cynicism in the run up to the MC 13. I think that's something which is a little unusual because normally in most MCs, uh, perhaps the stakeholders do realize that the outcomes are not going to be very robust. But this time, well before that, there was this degree of cynicism that nothing much is going to come out of the MC13. And at least uh, on paper, if we look at the outcomes, nothing much has actually happened. So what would be your take on that, on the outcomes of the MC13? Sure, sure. Well, look, Amitendo, I think I should probably uh, stipulate uh, right from the onset that that I consider myself to be an optimist by nature, and I'm certainly a true believer in the in the mission and the objectives of the WTO. But I have to say, the 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 only way that we could possibly regard the MC13 as a success is if we set the bar for success so low that it was practically practically touching the ground. And I think we, we have to recognize we are not in ordinary times. Um, the, the house is on fire. The, the, the rules-based multilateral global trading system, which has been in place and been a primary driver of development for three quarters of a century, is in the process of arguably at least collapsing right in front of our eyes. And so I think the metric then, given that these are the circumstances that we, uh, that we face, I think the, the metric that has to be applied and certainly the metric that I applied when I was looking at and evaluating the outcomes from MC13 was, has anything happened? Have, have we done anything that will significantly, and I would triple underline significantly, alter the extreme downward trend that the WTO, and by extension, the state of the, the multilateral trade system, has been on for, for a number of years. And I think looking at what, what came out of MC13 or, or, or what didn't come out of MC13, I think the answer to that question has to be no. We, we, we have not really fundamentally altered that, that extreme downward trajectory that we're on. And that, that's certainly reason for concern. Steve, uh, the 
the issue over here in the sense that as uh, we look at the MC13 and the functioning of the WTO as outsiders, I think there is this issue that uh, compared with the way things were maybe 20, 25 years ago, or even 10, 15 years ago, there is now a much greater tendency on part of global trade uh, to get recalibrated according to political expediencies and political choices. Now, my thinking on this is that this is perhaps unavoidable at a time when you said that you know we were living through times which are difficult. The house is clearly on fire and countries across the world are really not uh, sensing things from a very benign perspective, but highlighting the national security issues and geopolitics much above the others. Now, if this is the situation and where we see that uh, there is much and much and more evidence of trade getting conditioned to shifts in supply chains for geopolitical reasons. Uh, perhaps there is no significant emphatic decoupling, maybe with China or countries where there is sourcing concentration. But this trend is likely to continue. I think the mm -hmm. political uh, drive towards concentration of trade within a few partners is going to continue. Now, this, in a way, uh, could be a game changer. Uh, mm -hmm. for the functioning of the WTO, because obviously the the urge to multilateralize solutions is much less if there is a political driver to conditioning of global trade and supply chains. What are your thoughts on this? Well, well look, I, I think you really put your finger on a, on an extremely important uh, point, Amitendra, that I think it's it's worth us unpacking a little bit. We are, as you said, in a fundamentally different world in terms of our, our approach to international trade. And I think it's 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 useful to 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 recollect what has driven the the foundation of the global trading system in the immediate aftermath of the Second World War, what characterized the way that we conducted international trade for most of the past 75 years. But as you say, in the last 25 years or so, things have started to change. So previously, the, the primary ethos was that we were involved in a cooperative endeavor, that we believed in the integrity of the system, that we believed by working within the system, by compromising, which now unfortunately sometimes appears to be a dirty word, but by compromising and working to maintain the integrity of this global trading system, we would all benefit from that. That attitude, and that you know, that, that might sound a little bit Pollyannish or a little bit naive, but for most of the post-war era, that was the approach that most of the members brought to the GATT and then the WTO. But that is completely broken down in the last 25 years. And we see members no longer seeming to believe that, taking much more of a zero-sum approach uh, to these negotiations. And as you alluded to, now we have geopolitical rivalries now overlaying the conduct of trade policy, which are providing, um, depending on how you prefer to phrase it, either a rationale or an excuse for additional levels of, of, of trade and investment restrictions. So I think it's very important to recognize we're now in a, uh, in, a, in a completely different world. Now, in terms of the second part of your question, does this mean that we're headed towards a more fragmented system along the lines of these geopolitical fault lines? I think yes, but. And the but is, I, I think there's a story here. I think there's a headline, but then there's a bit of a subterranean story as well. Clearly, and we're, we're already starting to see this, the United States, for instance, is trying to reconfigure its supply chains, whether you call it nearshoring, whether you call it friendshoring. And we are starting to see some of the begin, some of the, the onset of those shifts taking place. But here's the word of caution that I have to introduce. If you dig a little bit deeper, you have to at least ask yourself the question, to what extent is this really happening? Because the United States can increase its imports from Mexico, but if those imports from Mexico, in an effort to decouple or diversify away from China, but if those quote unquote imports from Mexico are coming from Chinese owned factories or are coming from Mexican owned factories that rely very, very, very heavily 
on inputs and components from China, then I think you have to ask yourself the question, well, to, to what extent is this decoupling really taking place? So I think now we're entering um, into, in, into a period in which we're, we're almost going to have to, to, to answer your question definitively, Amitendo, I think we're going to have to take almost a forensic approach to trade and see where, where is this really coming from? You know, the headline might appear to be that we're seeing a certain degree of decoupling, at least in some sectors between the US and China. But if we really dig down a little bit deeper, is, is that decoupling really taking place or, or are products being trans-shipped through, uh, through third countries? Certainly uh, Vietnam, Malaysia, Indonesia, other countries in this part of the world um, are doing a robust business um, in that in that transshipment uh, uh, trade. So I think, uh, as I said, I think we're going to have to take a bit of a more forensic approach to trade to really be able to answer that question definitively. I think that was uh, an excellent uh, reflection of the dynamics, Steve. And what I uh, personally feel is that you uh, offered the example of Mexico. And I think Mexico is uh, typically emerging as one of those quote unquote, what we call the connectors in mm -hmm. modern global trade in the sense that they are probably a buffer economies where uh, a, a degree of uh, decoupling in a, in a very in principle sense is happening. But as you very rightly mentioned, uh, this is this is just trade, the existing pattern of trade getting diversified and reorganized. But the, but the starting point and the a destination are probably not remaining, uh, you know, uh, remaining uh, unchanged in that respect. And this is where I wanted to uh, kind of uh, get you into one of the developments which we really think has been very significant for the uh, conduct and character of global trade over the last five to 10 years. And that is uh, President Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. And we all see that a lot of uh, the current uh, new trajectories that we are getting to see in global trade actually began from the time uh, President Trump took office and the US-China tariff war began. And he also pushed his transactional approach mm -hmm. uh, to negotiating free trade agreements in, in a very Trumpian sense. And then, of course, the US disengagement gradually from the multilateral uh, dispute settlement process from the appellate tribunal and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, there is a, a rather strong possibility, I would say, of uh, President Trump being re-elected back to the United States. And uh, that would have significant bearings on global trade and regional trade. But since you also live and work out of Asia these days, apart from following the US trade mm -hmm. policy, how do you see a President Trump re-election panning out for US trade prospects with respect to you know, the bigger Asian economies, let us say China, India, Indonesia, maybe Malaysia. So, yes, yeah. Steve. Well, 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 look, that that is really the the, the sixty four thousand dollar question. <laughs> um, one one comment I want to make. I I think you correctly pointed out that we're seeing these supply chains become kind of reorganized and diversified, and I think that's that's absolutely right. But one important thing that this also means is they're being made more complicated. And I think that's an important thing to rely on in the future, because in the aftermath of the pandemic and the war in Ukraine, you know, the buzzword was resilience, resilience, resilience. And I'm worrying a little bit that in actuality, are we making supply chains more resilient if they're more complicated and more yeah. distended to sort of mask the true uh, the true origin of some of these products? Um, we might be setting ourselves up for some big for some big headaches um, down the road. I, ju I just wanted to mention that as a side note. Sure. Now, in terms of you know the possibility of Trump too, um, it would be hard to overstate the, the the potential impact of that on on the global trade system and certainly on the WTO. Um, Trump has made it perfectly clear that he intends to uh, apply 60% tariffs, 60, that's six at zero uh, percent tariffs across the board on China, and as he says, maybe higher, and then a quote unquote universal baseline tariff on everybody of, of 10%. Now, 
take a minute and and unpack what the likely scenario is here. So Trump, two weeks is a lifetime in politics, so we certainly shouldn't make any prognostications on the election. But for the sake of argument, assume that Trump is elected and these tariffs come to pass. The way this is going to play out is that if, if past is prologue, and it usually is, major U.S. trading partners will have no alternative but to slap a series of retaliatory uh, tariffs on the United States, which we can almost be certain that, that President Trump and his administration will be very happy to respond to with additional tit-for-tat um, tariffs. And at that point, we are off to the races, and we are looking at what would almost certainly be the most significant global trade war uh, since since the 1930s and 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 Smoot Hawley. Now it's important to note that this is not a bug in Trump's design. This is a feature of Trump's design because keep in mind he envisions himself to be the consummate negotiator who takes great pride at raising the stakes of the negotiation to the breaking point and then using that leverage to quote unquote negotiate um, the best deal. So as we embark on these rounds of, of tariff increases, expect to see sort of country by country, these mini trade deals being struck by countries which simply have concluded they can't countenance an ongoing trade war with the largest economy in the world. Um, expect these deals to have be highly transactional and have heavy mercantilist overtones. So I would really think, you know, we 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 don't have to strain our imaginations. I think the so-called phase one agreement uh, negotiated in Trump's first term, in which he attempted to commit China to making certain uh, commitments of importing certain products at certain um, dollar levels. I think that's probably what a lot of these uh, agreements are, are, are going to look like. So take a deep breath and say, OK, if, if that's the world that we're in, and I think the, the, the scenario that I sketched is entirely plausible, if that's the, if that's the world that we're in, the vision that we've had for three quarters of a century of a truly globalized multilateral trade system abiding by uh, a global trade rule book and most favored nation status for all members of this system, th that vision basically ceases to exist. And it will have been uh, replaced by a patchwork of these coerced mini deals with heavy mercantilist overtones um, and those countries that do not or are unwilling to meet, meet the, the, the terms set by Trump will face steadily escalating tariff walls and will, in effect, become least favored nations. So it's entirely plausible, I think, that that, that, that cornerstone and that cherished principle of the WTO of most favored nation uh, will be inverted, stood on its head. And at that point, I think we truly will be in a completely different world in international trade, one that we haven't seen in well over three quarters of a century. Steve, I think that uh, is, is uh, well, I mean, I, I'm not saying that it's a fearsome prospect because, uh, I mean, it, it, it also depends upon what we understand by fear, because by now, uh, Trumpian trade policies are not totally unknown to the world. And as you uh, rightly reflected, uh, this transactional approach based on what was already outlined in the phase one of the Trump presidency are what are going to be the assumptions on the basis of which the next phase of work will be carried out. But I wanted to push you a little deeper onto this and uh, bring back to what we began our conversation from, and that was the geopolitics. Mm. Now, what we see out here is uh, possibly a combination where there is a, a Trump-type trade policy coming in, which is essentially focused on uh, creating border tariffs, creating border walls, and also at the same time, trying to extract the maximum mileage 
out of the various trade deals, and you said the mini trade deals uh, that uh, might be a possibility coming up. So we already saw something like that happening in the first term with Japan. Mm -hmm. uh, we had seen that being recast, uh, recasted for the US uh, MCA. Now, when it comes to countries with whom the United States under a possible Trump presidency might actually work on those, uh, what are the countries uh, that you have on your mind? I mean, would it be, you know, India, Indonesia countries that uh, no longer have the GSP access to the U.S. market or some other ways of judging those? What might be the criteria? Yeah, it's, you, you know, you, you raise a fascinating aspect to all of this because on the geopolitical angle, despite the bombast and the over-the-top rhetoric, that we've grown accustomed uh, from from uh, uh, from uh, Trump. The fact of the matter is, you could make an argument that that President Biden actually has had a much uh, a much more pronounced geopolitical approach to his trade policies yeah. than Trump ever did. Trump being the ultimate uh, transactional, what have you done for me lately uh, type of negotiator, but. Um, Biden has been guided by a clear philosophical lodestar, and that is we are in the midst of a struggle between democracies and autocracies. And his trade policies have very, very clearly, and in some respects, predictably, followed along those geopolitical fall lines. Now, Donald Trump has no similar philosophical lodestar. If you put a gun to Donald Trump's head and say, what's your vision for a trading relationship with India or Indonesia? I don't think he could give you a single uh, coherent sentence on that. Biden could. Biden, Biden could because he's driven by this clear uh, uh, philosophical lodestar. So I ironically, under a Trump administration, I, I think there's at least the possibility that uh, the geopolitical aspects, the geopolitical fault lines, which have now, as you suggested at the top of our conversation, now permeated into the trade world, they might actually be de-emphasized. And look, we, we, we all know how the, the glowing terms um, that, that, that Donald Trump has used to describe some of those countries and some of those leaders that President yeah. Biden would regard as a, as a primary threat. So I, I think it's going to be very interesting to see how these geopolitical fault lines play out in a Trump administration and the extent to which they do or do not influence his, his approach to trade. The only thing I would feel comfortable at this stage in the game positing would be to say whether we are talking about India, whether we are talking about Indonesia or any other country, I think it's going to be transactional. I think it's going to be transactional much more than geopolitical. And that's also interesting, Steve, because if transactionality is getting a precedence over geopolitics and ideology, as, as you brought up, it would actually be a very interesting uh, set of permutations and outcomes to watch out for. I mean, they are going to be very disruptive. There's no denying that. But by what extent the disruptions will play out and what new equations and understandings will emerge? Uh, that, of course, I mean, as an exciter, as an uh, you know, as, as as an outsider, as an external actor, it might be very fascinating to watch. But I wouldn't really want to be in the shoes of a trade policy negotiator at that point in time. It's going to be, you know, a nightmare. And in fact, in fact, on that, Steve, I just wanted to, uh, as we are getting close uh, to the time that we have with us, I just wanted to bring you back to another uh, actor in world trade, uh, which has been casting a particular kind of influence and impact on the way it's all being shaped. And I'm talking about Europe in this regard. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, Europe has been, uh, well, Europe has, uh, by its own actions and ideas, appeared to stay committed to the multilateral trade agenda. It has mm -hmm. appeared to stay even more committed and action-oriented when it comes to the proximate challenges that the uh, civilization and world economy is facing. So mm -hmm. I'm referring to climate change, for example. But what's also uh, noticeable is that when you see something like a climate tax being introduced yeah. in terms of a carbon border adjustment tax, this has impact and the impact of it might not be totally similar to the Trump tariffs. Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. but nonetheless there is an impact now how do you see that playing out alongside what we are getting to see or what we might expect to see from the white house in about a year's time well i i am I'm, i'm so glad you raised this because i think this issue is really going to rocket up our agenda in terms of the importance and the impact it has i'll i'll, I'll highlight two two as- aspects in particular i think that this um uh, when the 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 cbam car- carbon border adjustment mechanism is fully implemented i think it could lead to one of the most contentious um and and eventually one of the most destructive trade battles we've seen because a number of countries have already lined up and said look european union we're sorry but we don't think you can do this we believe that this violates the non-discrimination principles of the WTO and so we're going to have a real battle royale within the WTO as to whether or not this is or is not consistent uh with the WTO the trade lawyers are engaged in a very energetic debate uh as to whether or not it is or it isn't i don't i don't know i think there's a reasonable case on either side but the point being you know yet again another contentious trade argument that's really going to royal our 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 global our our global trading our global trading system um the other important aspect of this that i would encourage all of us to keep an eye on i'm sensing the beginning of a growing backlash in less developed countries against uh eu and us attempts to sort of quote unquote export their values and i'm mm-hmm. seeing a lot of cynicism where a lot of people in the global south are saying look please don't tell us you're doing this because you've got any uh, uh great concern about uh environmental issues or your your corporate due diligence directive is about your concern about labor there's a growing sense that this is really just another flavor of disguised protectionism and that in any event that it's unrealistic mm-hmm. to expect countries in the position of an Indonesia, Malaysia, India, other countries that are going to be adversely affected by this to 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 really ramp up and to meet these these standards and you you run the risk of throwing the baby out with the bathwater yeah. you know trade has been the greatest driver of economic development in the post-war era era period full stop end of discussion and if by de- being too stringent in our expectations about what less developed countries are going to the extent to which less developed countries are going to be able to adhere to standards that the EU or the US might be able to um adhere to we might be disenfranchising the very people the very communities the very countries that need trade the most and that we need to keep engaged in trade to the greatest extent possible. So I'm so glad you raised the issue. I think number 1, I think we're going to have a real battle royale in the WTO as to whether or not it's consistent with trade rules and I would also keep my eye on this growing pushback that we're seeing from less developed countries about this whole uh, this whole concept of the west sort of quote unquote exporting their values and standards. Steve that was a fascinating uh, understanding that you brought us to and uh, I I know that we are pressed for time but I'm tempted to check you out on one particular thought on this last point that you mentioned this backlash do you really think that the way uh, things are being framed in the global trade and global policy order narrative this backlash might actually be instrumental in bringing a closer identity of the global south as we are talking about might it work in that way short answer yes yes i i i think so i think this will be another sort of rationale for 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 more coalescing among these countries as they figure out how, how do we want to how do we want to cope with this because yeah. the challenges are very steep for these countries let's let's be realistic about that thank you so much steve as always it's been a real real pleasure talking to you learning from your ideas becoming all that more wiser from your very valuable insights and thank you so much steve for giving your time to us my pleasure i'm attendo happy to chat at any time thank you so much
You are listening to Stephen Olson in this latest episode of the South Asia Chat, hosted by the ISAS at the NUS. To learn more about your work, you can visit us at isas.nus.edu.sg and you can also get updates on social media. Do keep following us and getting in touch with us. Thank you so much. Mm-hmm.